really, really bugging me, Slow you know? down. Everyone's going on and on. I mean, get up or let my hair down. Have a bit of fun. Helen, slow down. What I do? You all start getting at me. I'm not getting at you, but when you promise you'll do something, you've got to see it through. What kind of way is this to spend New Year's Eve? Stuck at home with Jack asking you the same question 15 times, Brian recycling the same old jokes, and Mum getting all weepy because of Josh. Look out! Oh, my God! <sighs> what was that? You hit someone. But I didn't. He came out of nowhere. Look back there, lying in the road. No! What I think we're going to do is uh, an episode where we go right across New Year's Eve, midnight, and pick it up at one o'clock in the morning in the police station. So we've got one of those lovely moments where we do an overnight and we continue the story at the point that we left off, which is, I think, a really exciting way of doing it. So, so the, the point at which he goes to the police station and we, we dramatise the police station is, is actually the beginning of the New Year's Day episode, I suspect. So what we've got is Tom at the police station, you know, there's this whole thing, and then at the end of that New Year's Day episode, at some point in that New Year's Day episode, Tom her, gets a call from Brenda saying, where are you? I've been trying to contact you, and Tom's like, you won't believe what, you know, I, I've, I've got... And she's like, never mind that, some bastard's hit my dad. <laughs> If the gods in this heaven, the queen's on her throne, and the archers is still dum de dumming, then the world can't be too bad. Headline in one of the papers, Jennifer expects by kind permission of the director general. Grace's death in the fire was probably the biggest event in British social history involving a drama, a soap opera, if you like, because so many people listened to the archers. It's not just passive entertainment. There is stuff that intrudes into your life and, and forces you to confront it, but at the same time, it's dressed with this nice, comfortable bubble which people can find themselves in every day. When I hear the theme song come on, everything around me just ceases, and I just totally focus on what's happening in Ambridge. There is something so disastrously wrong about that theme tune. I know so many people that they hear dead and it's off, it's off. I listen to the seven o'clock version whilst I wash my dishes. I sort of do something very homely and what I like at the same time as listening to the archers. Is this part of the new routine of married life to listen to the archers? It's a way of being. It's something you do, it's what you are. Walter Gabriel. He's never been replaced, Walter Gabriel, has he? I miss him still. What was that I heard? What's up then, Dan, my old pal? Well, I was just trying to work out in my own mind how we can keep the small holding going as well as Brookfield. Oh, that's all right. If it's all buckled in, we'll get to it. Aye, but giving Peggy a helping hand's one thing. Working for Dan Arch is another. Not to me, me old beauty. Glad to do the same for you as what I did for Peggy. Well, it's very good of you, Walter. On New Year's Day, 15,047 episodes ago, in the reign of Good King George, a story began. An everyday story of country folk. They lived in the village of Ambridge, in Borsetshire, in the very heart of England. I think the fact that the programme's made in Birmingham is important in so much as Birmingham is in the middle of the country, so it's Middle England. And it's very easy for people in this city to get out into the countryside. Most people are within a quarter or a half an hour of a green field. And for those who can't get out into the countryside or who don't, yes, Ambridge can provide a window into that world. Oh, here 
did lead me to believe he'd take the carrots when they were ready. Supermarkets lead you to believe a lot of things. No, he was genuinely interested. And today, you'll see an actual bag full with a picture of the farm and our blurb on. It screams local. Mm. I may not be a British citizen, I may just be a dumb American who likes hot dogs, but gosh, I've got my finger on the pulse of British culture. I wouldn't say that the show has changed for me in any particular way. It's more like my circumstances that have changed that make me, when I look back at certain things, I think, oh, well, that was when I lived in London. Oh, that was before netcast, and I had people sending me omnibuses on tapes, you know. Oh, and this is now when we have netcasting, and I can listen to The Archers whenever I want to. So The Archers has never changed for me. It's me changing, not The Archers. Yeah. What are you holding your hand out for? Housekeeping, of course. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Once upon a time, there was a farmer. His name was Dan, and he had a wife. Her name was Doris. Dan and Doris begat Jack, Phil, and Christine. Phil married Grace. Grace, come back! The roof's collapsing! For God's sake, Grace, come back! Then he married Jill. Be quiet, Shula. You've had yours. I've got to get Daddy's now. And they begat Shula, Kenton, David, and Elizabeth. Your baby has a narrow valve preventing blood getting into the main artery supplying the lungs. There's also a hole between the two large pumping chambers. That sounds awful. David married Ruth, and they begat Pip, Josh, and Ben. What's Pip been up to? She and Izzy have been shut in their room all afternoon. Oh. What do they do in there? Oh, you know, the girls' stuff. Like their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents before them, they live at Brookfield Farm in Ambridge. It's the principal home of the Archer family, and it's always been a place of happiness and stability, especially for its current inhabitants, David and Ruth. Their marriage steady as a rock. Or so we thought, until relatively recently. So, here's to friends reunited. Mm? Mm. Friends mm. reunited. Mm. And the beginning of the next stage of our beautiful friendship. <laughs> mm. I, I know I shouldn't feel like this about you, Ruth. But I do. I can't bear to see David. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. She really thinks that David doesn't actually love her, that he behaved, or she feels, she fe he's hurt her very well, deeply. Can I point out something, that she only has his say that, that, that he hasn't had an affair with, that he hasn't slept with Sophie. And Sophie is all over him and has been for a long time. And I think that, that, that Ruth is worried that, that, that David might have slept with Sophie. I think she is really worried about it. That's, that's, yeah. that's rationalising it too yeah, much I in a way she, with Ruth. I think yeah. she should be absolutely at the, at the mercy of this passion. I'm a conductor of an orchestra, if you like, of writers and producers and researchers and experts whom we ask things of and wonderful actors and so on. And, and it, what I do as an editor is to shape. It is a responsibility. And you have responsibility to be yeah, exactly. accurate, both in terms of the facts and emotionally accurate. And that's the big one, emotionally accurate uh, to the characters. And it was only one kiss. Yeah. I love you, Ruth. Do you? long surviving things seem to create their own life in a very peculiar way. It has a group of actors, some of whom have been in from the very beginning, who 
encapsulate a world that in many ways is lost to us. We move so quickly now, things have gone so quickly, and this program goes back half a century, and you know, most people don't remember, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. We're in such small little compartments of time. I think part of its glamour is the fact that it can be very, very ordinary. Ah, oh, Ruth, dear. Who are these lovely flowers from, by the way? Oh, Sam gave her those. Mm, good taste. Now, please, hurry up, you two. Oh, I've finished anyway. Going to check the combine. Oh, is it working properly now? Two fried eggs or one? Eh? Two eggs or one? Two, please. I think our listening figures have crept up because, in a way, the world has come full circle and it's done telly and it said, yes, telly's great, but it's part of what we do now. It's not the big new thing, the only thing we do. You know, the internet is taking over. Young people are watching less television. We require a portable lifestyle. What is more portable than a small radio or iPod, which you can get a radio program on? What is more portable than a 15-minute program? We repeat in different ways from different perspectives enough so that if you miss the old episode, you can stick with it. You know what's happening. That is the perfect recipe for fast modern culture to stay with us, to, to, to find us, actually, not just stay with us, to find us. The latest report to reach London from Budapest says that this afternoon, Soviet aircraft started bombing one area of the city near one of the main railway stations. A broadcast by Moscow Radio at about that time claimed that what it called the counter-revolutionary forces in Hungary had been crushed. Because it's always on after the news, there is that... And this isn't about it being cosy. It's not about it being... It's not a cosy programme. It's ridiculous to say it's cosy. It's not. It is. There's the news, which is usually awful. And then it's... And meanwhile, in Ambridge, and you think, no... That is as real as the news. Families are as real as the news. People getting on as, are as real as the news. What goes on is as real, you know, and, it, and people need that. So if Ambridge is real, where is it exactly? The village of Ambridge lies in the heart of the English countryside, midway between the towns of Borchester and Felpersham. It houses a typical rural community, and in spite of modern advances in agriculture and transport, it has somehow still managed to stay unspoiled. Hancock's target was the unforgettable character of Walter Gabriel, still a household name to this day. Right you am, me old pal, me old beauty. Walter's voice is as reassuringly familiar as the voices of one's family and friends. We know a lot about these everyday country folk. After all, their lives are kept under constant surveillance. Let me show you what's in here. This is why I keep the archive cards. We don't use them that much now because most of the information is on computer. But they were set up in 1951 when the programme first started. And under A, we've got Archer, and D for David. So these are David's cards, and they date back to when he was born. Look, we'll have to stop this. Why? Calling him Snowball. <laughs> As you can see, he was born in September 1959, Phil and Jill. And Dan, his grandfather, he had blonde hair at the time, although it's probably darkened by now. It might even be grey by now. Uh, and he was nicknamed Snowball. We've got to decide. Well, you know, I've been through the short list dozens of times. Mm -hmm. And I still like David. So do I. Mm. David Archer. In 1969, he's showing, he's, he's showing an attitude towards farming, so he's actually already showing that he could be a, a farmer back in 69. And he went off to boarding school, they move on a bit, and then on the 14th of May, 85, going out with Sophie Barlow, who is very thick. <laughs> David proposed to Sophie watching the royal wedding. Um, that's not Charles and Diana, that was Fergie and... Edward? No. Who did Fergie marry? I've forgotten. Andrew. Andrew. Thank you. Fergie <laughs> <Okay>, Andrew. <laughs> Sophie accepted. 
And in the end, they, they uh, came to agreement and the wedding was called off and they drifted apart. And Sophie went to live in London and then she came back. I was such a silly girl. Oh, I was silly too. We were very young. Too silly to appreciate what I had. I should never have let you go. I know it sounds very strange, but you really do care what happens to these people. They're almost like my family. I want to know what's happening. I want to not miss out on life in Ambridge. So, let's get this straight. The storyline leading up to the 15,000th episode goes like this. David Archer is married to Ruth. After 18 years of happy marriage, Ruth's been driven to distraction by the return of David's former fiancée, Sophie, to Ambridge. Convinced they've been having an affair, Ruth has found consolation in the arms of Sam, the herd manager. It turns out that Sam's been secretly in love with Ruth for ages. I'm totally gripped by the David and Ruth story. Although it's so realistic, it's quite upsetting. It's a little bit like listening to uh, favourite aunts and uncles having marital difficulties, and that tends to get an emotional response from me. Come on. Surely we can work our way through this. I don't know. I'd give anything, anything, to have things back the way they were. But that's not possible, is it? Part of us thinks David walked away from Sophie. I should just be able to go to Sam. No, no chance. And she can't. She's hugely torn between these two guys. One has got all that newness and passion that we talked about. The other has got years of a beautiful marriage with lovely kids. I think if you put David and Sam on scales at the moment, the moment that we are now talking about, it would be evenly balanced. I think that is her problem. It's, it's a very strange job being editor of The Archers. It's a great responsibility. It's like being put in charge of one of the stately homes of England. You've got to keep it going, and you've got to keep it going well. Sophie David, David Ruth. It's Liz Rigby who sowed the seeds of it all. When she became editor, Sophie was already David's fiance, but Liz soon decided that Sophie wasn't the one. If it weren't for Liz, there'd never have been a Ruth Archer. I have thought things through. So, Sophie. It's funny, I drove to London to tell her how I felt about her, but before I could, she told me how she felt. And how is that? The same as me. It really is all over between us. You have this incredible power over the whole of Ambridge, and it's very, very frightening. Do you, uh, do you like it enough to write it? Well, yes, I'm a... <laughs> Sold to the man in the blue yes. shirt. You've got David and Sam interacting with, with a, a subtext from Sam, but, but again, David unaware of a key thing. I think myself that you ought to have a perfectly normal birth, and it seems to me that one more archer will be as much as we would want. So David goes up to look at the cows, he finds Sam in a carving box, about to start intervening, it's a posterior presentation. <laughs> Well, that's the future trend. Cattle born without horns, and somehow or other, we've got to get that into the archers. It's the archers. I think I would hope to introduce a little more social realism. We don't want social realism in the archers. We just want Ambridge. We must give a true and accurate picture of what life is like in the country in this year of 1969. Most of the letters of appreciation, the average, the typical letter of appreciation, came from a social worker in Islington. What do you think, Sam? Well, yes, you... I think you should lose this and put George in a much stronger position. Well, Fallon and Ed, I thought they were working really well together. And he could say, well, look, I told you so, let's get rid of it. David has severed his relationship with Sophie. An important thing to remember here is, is that w one of the changes we've made is that Sophie, far from being vulnerable about that, actually has more or less said, fine, that's how you feel. I just didn't feel I could really go with Sophie if I were 
planning a, a programme for 50 years, and so I, they were unengaged. <laughs> and as time went on, I brought in somebody who I felt, um, I felt that was a good seed that I could plant for the future, that she was the right one, this was the right character. You can be too cautious, you know, Ruth. If you're going to make a life in farming, you'll have to realise that. You can be, yes. But someone once told me that no farmer's ever gone bust by being too cautious. What? Quite the opposite, in fact. Are you trying to tell me how to run a farm? No, I'm not. Good. I'm keen to learn, David, and I'm keen to learn from you. From time immemorial, it's love that's made the soap go round. Let's face it, love and marriage go together like a horse and plough. Do you remember when I first met you? Of course, Nappy Canteen. And you explained to me the, the thrill of ploughing properly. I was. Mm. When you were only 16 and your father let you take Blossom and Boxer and open up your first furrow. Cool, by golly, yes. Old Blossom and Boxer. A lovely pair of horses they were. Yes. Don't be fooled. For those of you too young to remember, Peggy's marriage to Jack Archer was a disaster. Jack was that rare creature, a wayward archer, whose desperate alcoholism was hardly helped by the fact that he ran the village pub, The Bull. Why does everybody want me out of the way? Why? What's going on behind my back? Why do you want to get rid of me for a start, Peggy, eh? Come on, tell the truth. What's going on? I want to know and I intend to know. Oh, now. Dad, what would you do with him? Well, if I had known it was impossible, I'd say he'd been drinking. Oh, that's always the easy way out, isn't it? Take no notice of Jack, he's been drinking. In the end, he was seen off by liver failure, which gave Peggy the freedom to find happiness with another Jack, Jack Woolley. For years, side by side, they presided over the fortunes of Grey Gables. Ooh, nice and warm in here. No corner of the human heart goes unexplored in Ambridge. Listen to me, Eddie Cundy. I work blimmin' hard around yeah, here. No, I ain't complaining. I knew that's how it would be when I married Clary, you. Look. You think I'm gonna move out of our bedroom and kick downstairs on the 16th? Oh, no. What is that? Where's our William, look? Oh, dear. So when was all this arranged? What? This cosy family outing. You're not jealous. Yeah, of course I am. Oh, God. No. Oh, what? Oh, what does it say? No. no, that can't be right. There must be some mistake. There must be. What does it say? It says Will is George's father. Oh. I can't understand it. The perfect mix for a soap opera is a, a very limited number of basic characters. Mother figure all important, the father figure to go with it. Young lovers. She asked me. Asked you what? To father a child. <coughs> what? You're not serious. I am. I think it's a fantastic idea. Now, all lovely and innocent so that you can have a marvellous time with them. Then some mature lovers so that we can have intrigue and difficulties and problems come. Just what kind of a bander do you think I am? I'm not sure. Yet. Uh, then you want a good comedy character or an eccentric. Get up then, Cherry. Hey, I know half a more. Oh, don't you talk to me. Get up, Cherry. Oh, well, I got to see. Women. And then what you need most of all is, is, is um, somebody you can hate, you know. The spirits are detached observers of what is passing before them and of Scrooge's reaction to it. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Again. Joe, give her the cue, please. Yeah. The creator of the Archers, Godfrey Baisley, was the BBC's producer of agricultural programmes for the Midlands. He had a vision and it turned him into a broadcasting legend. Declaration of Intent by Godfrey Baisley, August 1950. Purpose. 
to present an accurate picture of country life. And in so doing, draw portraits of typical country people and follow them at work and at play. And to eavesdrop on the many problems of living that confront country folk in general. Presentation in play form with all the characters played by actors. Policy. The most important thing here is accuracy. To keep a good balance between the purely factual and the more entertaining aspects of country life. And to keep in mind always that the programme be directed to the general listener, i.e. the townsman. And through the entertainment, develop an appreciation of the inexhaustible diversions to be found in the countryside. These to be kept as topical and seasonal as possible. That's about it, really, isn't it? All right, Godfrey, let's say then that the new squire of Ambridge introduces hornless cattle in place of horned cattle. That's what you want? No, not all his cattle, his beef cattle. Well, why? Because uh, he can get more cattle into the same space. Well, it may be sound economically, Godfrey, but with all the goodwill in the world, what storyline can we get out of that? That's just what I was wondering about. Godfrey Baisley's statement of intent doesn't spell out quite why he dreamed up the archers in the first place. Do you like standing in a queue for your vegetables? Or do you think it's tiring and a waste of valuable time? Do you ever find your long wait has been useless? But supplies With Britain still reeling from the privations of the Second World War, Godfrey wanted farmers to know about the latest trends in agriculture. Dig for victory. His plan was to use his radio drama to help maximize the production of food for the nation. in vegetables eight months of the year. Hello. Oh, look over there, Dad, in the corner. There's a couple looking a bit down in the mouth. Oh, are they weepy about the eyes and nose? Yes, I'm afraid so. That's torn it. That's dished it, Harvey. Oh, not foul pest, Dan. Oh, you better telephone the Ministry vet right now. Right away, Dad. You have this wonderfully powerful creation, which can simultaneously and does do these very strong, real stories that can speak to people, but at the same time has this wonderful element of what do you want to call it? I don't know, miss, if you like. The agricultural rhythm of life is one that we do aspire to. This sense that there is a time to sow, and there is a time to reap, and there is a time when sheep have their lambs. I think that's very, very important. And because so many people have lost that now, if they switch on the archers, they should just get a little sense that it's that time of year, isn't it? roots this a little bit more closely in the soil, even if you live in a high-rise flat. You're, you're getting this ready for the sheep? You got it. So, uh, does that mean...? Yeah, it's scab. Some of the stuff, I have to say, I'm literally eyebrows raised to heaven, like, no... not an iota of understanding of what I'm talking about. But, you know, essentially, it's an agricultural programme. It's about farming, and there's something really fascinating about hearing that language. Well, the question is, how are we going to it? I've talked it through with Brian. You know, we don't want to go messing about with OPs. Mm, and we can't use pyrethroids anymore either, so dipping's out. Mm -hmm. I have to inject them with an antiparasite. I've got some notes on this for you, Mary, if you need to know what posterior presentation is, the carving. But, I mean, basically, it's a difficult carving that Sam could do on his own and would rather, in the circumstances, would rather work on his own, but if, if there's two people doing it, the job's a lot easier. She started, is she? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it would be today. All the signs. Ah. Everything OK so far? Ah, might be a bit tricky. It's a posterior presentation. Mm. So David comes and scents slightly naively and wants to help with this... Um, carving, and Sam is resistant to have it working that closely with David at this moment. Sam will hate that, and I think this can precipitate Sam to saying to Ruth, we have to do something honest about this. I can't stand this. Do you think we should call the vet? Ah, oh, there's no need. He could inject a muscle relaxant. I know he could. Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's all right. The calf's in no danger. Oh, I suppose not. 
And the cow's not in any distress. Just let nature take its course. Another blow to the farming industry, the return of foot and mouth disease. Normally we plan our stories three or four months ahead and there's plenty of time to develop them and plan it very carefully. Every so often the real world throws up something so dramatic that it kind of implodes on you and all the stories have to go out the window and foot and mouth was probably the in my time was one of the biggest events, the biggest catastrophe really to, to hit agriculture. Just on my way to look at the ewes. Can't be too careful now. Yes, it's bad news, isn't it? Oh. And I think what you poor farmers have had to contend with over the last few years. Absolutely. Makes you wonder whether we're ever going to get back to normal, whatever that is. Mm. I was talking to Dad earlier. He was full of it, of course. Well, I'm not surprised. He'll remember the epidemic of 67, as I do, unfortunately. Yes, and what about when foot and mouth hit Brookfield back in the 50s? Of course. His Dan lost his entire herd, didn't he? Yep, it nearly drove him out of farming. I think we really did give a sense of you know, the isolation and the fear that most farmers felt. So much so that actually we got a lot of letters and a lot of phone calls left on, on the voicemail thanking us, from farmers thanking us for sort of expressing their feelings and their sense of isolation and outrage, really, at, at what was happening to them. Was that Shula? Yeah, she says Pip was fine. Went into school, no problem. Oh, that's good. It's only day one, there's a way to go yet. Well, she understands. I've... She knows why she's had to move out. Yeah. She's tougher than she looks. Like her mum, eh? Maybe. Doesn't matter what's happening anywhere else. We just got so much to lose. Yeah. Oh no, Clary, it's a worrying time, that's for sure. <laughs> they're introducing a new character and they're bound to give them a ridiculous regional accent. Well, they better not be speaking in a yokel West Country accent, Jack. Me, Eddie and Joe have cornered the market in people who sound like roadies for the Wurzels. <laughs> and I don't want them coming from Birmingham. Not after I spent decades perfecting my stupid, wittering brummy. <laughs> well, who knows, Ruth? They might be a Geordie like you. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, so this is Studio 9D, which is where we record the archers and where all illusions come to die, basically. Cow sheds and sports halls and things like that, anything that needs an echoey acoustic, St Stephen's Church, that sort of thing. Mary. Take thee, Sydney. Take thee, Sydney. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. Windows and doors and so on. I'll close the door. Blossom Hill Cottage there and Willow Farm there. And now I'll take you through to the soft area. You can see that here we've got basically everything that you would need, you know, to, for a, a good domestic scene. It's very kind of you, Kenton. Isn't it, David? What? We've got the kettle. Not just for the sound of a kettle boiling, but actually hot water sounds different from cold water. Hello, Hello Granddad. Granddad. Oh, lovely. I could do with a cup of tea. So if we're pouring that, then we actually like to use hot water if we're pouring a cup of tea. Um, another thing that we can use here... You shouldn't ever underestimate the versatility of the humble rubber glove. Um, we wouldn't just use this, you know, for washing up scenes or, you know, if someone's actually putting on a pair of rubber gloves. But if you fill it with water, suspend it above a bucket and just snip the edge off one of the fingers and squeeze it, you've got a fabulous milking cow udder sound. <laughs> Thank you. 
I remember when I was living in Shepherd Market in Mayfair and we were going to move and my mother said to me, she said, if you can't live here anymore, where would you like to live? And I said, in Ambridge with the archers. Ah, Ambridge, yes. But with all the goings-on between David and Ruth, probably not Brookfield just at the moment. Deep down inside this programme, there is something which is secure, which celebrates family life, which celebrates the importance of long-term relationships within or outside marriage now, which celebrates a, a world in which you can, in the end, come to rest in security. I value that. One of the reasons I listened and enjoyed the programme as a listener was that. It can be smug if it's badly handled, it can be trite, but it can be wise and warming and solid if it's well handled. Now, we're attacking that at the moment with David and Ruth. That is difficult. I'll get it. Oh, no, you won't. Give it to me. That's your dad's mobile. Look who it is. Mum! Ben, I'm not telling you again. Go on, now! Hello, David. It's me. Hello? David's gone out. Oh, is that Ruth? Yeah. There's always been a spine of the Brookfield family. You know, the very first episode started at Brookfield Farm. And still, we have the descendant of Dan, that first farmer, in the person of David and his wife, Ruth. I just wanted you to know I've changed my mind. About? Yeah. I will come to Oxford with you. I think it is good that we've we've taken the central, the absolute central relationship of the programme, and we've we've put upon it the the very real stresses of of living in the modern age. Most people in long-term relationships and marriages will recognise that there are times when that happens in their own. And the question is, of course, will they survive? Will Brookfield continue to be the centre of the show? There's no reason why it should be. There are plenty of other strong families and other strong characters elsewhere. Morning, brother. What do you want? I expect you were here at the crack of dawn, that right? You're so conscientious. Yeah, I was here early. I was at the U. Came out before the post then? Yeah. That's a pity. I got a very interesting letter this morning, and I reckon you'll have had the same one. Well, the test results. That's right. And? Well, no surprises, really. Not for me, anyway. Not for you? No. I always knew I was George's father. You are? I always said I was, and guess what? I am. I think Emma fell in love with both of them for very different reasons. Ed had always been the rebel and the bad one and the one that's unreliable, so she, he wasn't the best person to marry. So she went for Will. And, yeah, then on the... It was her hen night. We ended up sleeping with each other. And then she got pregnant. And we didn't know who's, who was the father. I mean, it does ring of Jerry Springer immediately, but... That is real life. The, these stories do happen. It, it does happen. I think Emma was disappointed, eventually, after thinking that she wanted to be with Ed, that it was Will's baby. Now, it was fascinating to hear people's responses to it, because when I'm playing Emma, I totally endorse all her decisions. You know, I have to. I have to go through my mind, what, you know, why is she doing this? And to that, to her, and therefore, to me, it's totally logical what she does and she, whether she's responding to passion or whatever. But the response was absolute hatred. For the most part, she was vilified. Like, you know, people just had no sympathy for her. Oh, Emma, Emma, who is Emma? What is she? 
there's a strange sort of split-minded thing about whether we're actors or characters, which has never really been resolved. I personally think Emma is a stupid little girl and who shouldn't have been thinking about getting married anyway and certainly shouldn't have been thinking about getting married when she knew perfectly well she was torn between the two brothers. The whole Emma storyline has been very infuriating, but I just wanted to kill her, basically, and so every day I had to listen more and more. Oh, come on, it's only a radio programme, isn't it? Uh, the thing is, I never think of them as actors. I mean, you never find out who they are. I mean, they never say who's in it at the end. And it, I think it's much better that way. To me, they're, they're people. They're the people in Ambridge. They're the people in the Arches. I know down to the finest detail what they look like. I mean, if you were to show me the real actors, it would just destroy every illusion I'd have about them. I mean, it, you know, they would say the pictures are better on radio. Well, they are certainly better in my head. For me, in the 20th and 21st century running the Archers, it's seeing the actors uh, on camera and seeing them in publicity photographs isn't really an issue. It's part of the marketing tools that we use to promote the programme. And I'm quite happy with the fact that, you know, listeners who enjoy looking at them can see them out there. Uh, and listeners who don't will choose not to, not to look. And you mustn't forget that, that Godfrey, Baisley, years and years ago, had photographs of um, the actors, sometimes dressed up in character, um, to promote uh, the programme even then. I think we do it more and more now when we live in an increasingly visual age. Well, if Godfrey Baisley insisted on it, I feel we've got no choice. If you are convinced that the pictures are always better in your head, I suggest you look away now. You're about to see the actors. Three, two, one, run VT. She wears very casual clothes, usually tracksuit bottoms, loose sort of fitting t-shirt, and maybe a hoodie or something, and a pair of trainers, and likes to wear a lot of mascara. She's really into her mascara quite big black lashes, which she'll put on automatically when she gets up in the morning. The chap did once uh, get introduced to me and said, no, 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 and was very upset that I was as I am, and said, no, 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 Debbie is blonde with a big arse, which I took as a compliment. I don't think that Adam looks particularly remarkable. He's, um, he's attractive, but most importantly, most definingly, he has a shock of red hair. I wouldn't say I, I live like Ian, do you know what I mean? I'd like to be as good as a chef as he is, but I'm not. <laughs> Hello, my name's Ed Grundy. <laughs> what would she be like? Oh, no, that's thrown me completely. Can't imagine Cathy having a corporeal existence. <laughs> we are married. We are Mr and Mrs in real life, and we are cousins through marriage in the Archers. People have mixed, mixed ideas and feelings about seeing what we look like, obviously, and people have always, it's extraordinary, said to me when they meet me, oh, my, oh but I've always imagined you're tall and dark. So for some reason or other, my voice obviously paints a picture in their minds of somebody who is tall and dark and not small and, and I've always been blonde. I, I tried to sound like Sylvia Peters when I first joined, with a high voice, with very received pronunciation. In fact, we all did, unless we were playing yokels. But of course now it isn't, it's glottal shocks and um, no consonants. 50-something years to have been playing the same part. That I find very hard to believe, except I know it's true. It's been too good to leave, you know. Still raining, then? Yeah, just that fine rain. <laughs> Still wets you through, though. Help yourself to tea, Dad. Oh, thanks. At least it'll have damped down the bonfire. True. Fireworks were terrific, weren't they? Yeah. Kids loved it. So, what are my instructions for when Ruth's away? 
Let's not beat about the bush, Phil. The real question is, what's Ruth going to get up to while she's away? It does just take you over. It's, it's quite hard to explain, and I think people perhaps think you're a bit precious about it because it's, you know, quotes, only a soap. But it's precisely because it's like that, and you've actually, you're, you're, you're writing in a continuum, that I think it is so absorbing. Ruth's having a night away, actually, on Tuesday. Is she? Yeah, she's going to see an old college friend in Oxford, Laura. Laura? Did she come to your wedding? Yeah, that's right, she did. Finding writing 15,000 completely draining. Um, it sounds pathetic, but because I'm living in all the characters' heads, certainly in David's and, and Ruth's, David's completely innocent at this, at this point. He, and ignorant, really. He doesn't know what Ruth's going to go and do. He thinks he's waving her off to go and see a friend, and he thinks that's a good thing. He thinks their marriage is repairing. Here, you're going away, Ruth. Sorry? Seeing your friend. I remember her from your wedding. The heel snapped off her shoe, poor girl. Ah, uh, that's right. What's she doing now? She, uh, she still works for the same firm. But in Oxford. I thought she was in Basingstoke at one point. Well, they send her all over. It's a feed company, isn't it? That's right. Is she married? Obviously, this friend isn't in Oxford, but, you know, she's kind of Christmas card friend. And, I mean, I don't think it'll be David. David just say, oh, you're going to see Sally, oh, that's very nice, whatever this woman's name is. But then, you know, if they do meet up with the family, which is down here to meet up at the bonfire, you know, <coughs> lo and behold, Jill remembers this girl yeah. from the wedding, yeah. and she's saying, oh, wasn't she in Basingstoke? Yeah. And Ruth's thinking, oh, God, I've got to get to Oxford. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the whole lie escalates. Love it. She'll hate lying as well. I mean, it's not her. Told. What have you said? I didn't know what to say. Just an old friend asked me to stay. Sort of uh, true, that. <laughs> I suppose. Sam gets there and he checks in, and it's all this stuff about, you know, will you be wanting an early morning call? No. Uh, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. <laughs> Um, and he, Ruth stops for petrol, because, of course, can't have her on the phone and driving. And, uh, you know, he phones her. Oh, she can't use her mobile on a forecourt. Never mind, she stops, calls him, yes, I'm on my way. One of the things you could do is to, while all this is going on, is intercut back to David. Because what that does subliminally is to say to the, the listener, look what she is leaving. Little bit of pepper, in it goes. Little bit of ketchup from the number. I've had an Little idea. Little bit of what? If you take out Ben's helping, then the rest of us can at least have mushrooms. Oh, that's right. Make it more complicated. If you did this to Gordon oh, Ramsay... I thought it was genius. All right. David and Ruth have been through so much together. On the other hand, we could just go to bed. Mm -hmm. Read. Mm. Foot and mouth, breast cancer... A nasty badger shooting episode. Well, your oil and water's fine. Thanks, David. Do you fill up with petrol? Yep. Good. No, it's pointless having to stop. Could their 18 year marriage really be about to come to an end? Can she not get to the hotel? Can and she then not... she cannot go through the door. She gets to the hotel and she can't go through the door, and, and she calls him and he comes down and, and they talk in her car. Yeah, oh, can I put in a plea for a face-to-face -face thing? Because yeah. because we built up to it so much, yeah. I really hate the you idea of them like being that. on. And that's a really good idea. Yeah. Interior Ruth's car, Oxford Hotel car park, 6.35 p.m. Effects as before, deathly atmosphere in car. Ruth, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Please, Sam. But I can't do it to David, to the kids, deceiving him and them. The lies I've told, I've lied to him more in the last two weeks 
than in the last 18 years. Yeah, I, uh, I know you hate lying. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. But what about me? You love me. I'm sorry. Oh, you love me. I'm sorry. You love me, don't you? Yeah, you, you know I do. I do love you. And I know you love me. But I can't be with you. No. I mean it. I'm sorry. But I can't do it. I can't go through with this. I can't go through with any of it. Sam. Fabulous, you two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Well done. I had an idea that he hands in his resignation to both David and Ruth together. And his actual motive, when he does it, what he's actually doing is making it as official as possible so that no, you know, there's no implication of why he's leaving. But when we actually immediately see him, if he doesn't say anything, he walks into that room and says, I need to speak to both of you. Mm -hmm. <gasps> So today is my last day on the Arches. Uh, I've been on it uh, two and a half years. Um, I was told at the beginning of the job how long it would be and exactly what was going to happen. It was planned two uh, and a half years in advance. Um, and so I knew that I would come to a fairly sticky end. All actors, when you are earning a large part of your uh, family living. money, living through something, uh, and it's paying for your children and your mortgage, and you, you, of course you worry. Now, what exactly was I supposed to be looking at in here? Oh, uh, the cow. The cow, I see. Yes, yes, she looks a bit odd. She goes berserk if there's a sudden noise. Joe, what are you doing? I'll see what she does if you make a noise. No, I don't think that's a very good idea, Joe. was knocked over by one of Eddie Grundy's BSE-ridden cows. Head split open on the floor. Life support machine two weeks. Excuse me, this is worrying moments. So I got the script. You open the envelope and, uh, what am I going to read next, you know? And then he developed epilepsy. And, uh, you know, we were close to selling the car. Actor, I'm perfectly happy to play my death scene. Or even give you something like Phil ringing up Jill and saying... Uh, and what's the matter, but I, I don't feel awfully well. As a matter of fact... Hello? Hello, Phil? Phil? The time will come when Jill will shuffle off the mortal coil, and I hope, unless I... I Paddy actually dies in the studio, which would be quite nice. But I would quite like the powers of E to say, would you like to do your own death? I'm, I'm sure I'd do it beautifully. Um, and quickly, probably. It's very difficult because one has grown old. And one can see that one has grown old. And one's part has dwindled, therefore. Um, so I'm, it's all really a little bit like life. You don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. So there's a bit of mystery about that, which is really quite nice. And never If there's a celebration in Ambridge, then uh, instead of a regular bottle of champagne, we like to have a bicycle pump.
I always sleep very badly when I'm writing the arches because it's all just, it's all in your head, it's all buzzing about like a box of wasps and you can't get it out of your head. Tony, you always speak up, lad, I can't hear you. Well, I haven't said anything yet. Is it Tony? Give him a chance, Tony. You, you'll have to speak up, Tony. Oh, dear, oh, Lord. You can do anything you like on the archers. You could do the most heart-wrenching drama. Tony? As long as the next scene you cut back to Lakey Hill. I sent Jennifer to bring her. Oh, you all having a nice party? Never mind us. How's the once upon a time there was a farmer. His name was Dan, and he had a wife. Her name was Doris. They lived in the village of Ambridge, in Borsetshire, in the very heart of England. A story began. An everyday story of country folk. Whose turn is it next to take the limelight? How about the ever unpopular Emma Grundy? Young baby George. I think I'm holding him upside down, actually. There we are. Sleep well, George. Are she and Ed going to rekindle their romance? What about Brian Aldridge? Sooner or later, he'll have to decide who will inherit Home Farm. It's his farm, his money, and he who pays the piper calls the two. I'm sounding like a man, huh? But, I mean, I do think that's how I play him. Might his love child, Rory, get it all? No. For now, it's none of them. Look out! Oh, my God! <sighs> what was that? You hit someone. But I didn't... He came out of nowhere. Look, back there, lying in the road. No! She doesn't do things by halves ever, does she? When she's withdrawn at home, she's completely withdrawn at home. When she's besotted with Ross, it's completely besotted with Ross. And when she's playing the field and being a ladette, again, you know, she, she, she's just completely extreme yeah. with it. Are you OK? No! I am not OK! And if I ever find out who'd done this to me, I'll kill him! Today, the focus on Willow Farm, home of Mike Tucker who was knocked down by a car in a rather nasty accident last night. I've got something to tell you. What's the matter? It was me, knocked down your dad. What? Or rather, it wasn't me, it was Helen, but... Well, I've told everyone it was me, because Helen had a few drinks. You know how she gets, and if anyone found out, she'd probably... Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But... Stop! Stop! What, what are you saying? Helen was driving. Yeah. But she was drunk. Yeah. I mean, not legless, but... She hit my dad. Yeah. And didn't stop. I don't think we've heard the last of this. If you missed The Archers today, it'll be repeated, as always, at two minutes past two tomorrow afternoon. And there'll be more from Ambridge tomorrow night, just after seven on Radio 4. Stay here on BBC Four for the New Year's Day concert from Vienna. That's next.